pray and ask the Lord's help. I want to do something very important. This is the copy of the Ingemal New Testament. And some of our folks went to Cameroon a few weeks ago to participate in the celebration of the dedication of this New Testament. And we as a church were given this copy and on the front page is inscribed a message to us from the missionary who went out from us and participated in the translation of this New Testament. And I want to read his message to us as a church on all three campuses. And so please receive this from Steve Anderson as a a word of thanks to the church. October 20, 2007, dear Bethlehem, after growing up at Bethlehem, I was sent out as one of your missionaries in 1971. Arriving in Cameroon in October 1973, I then worked alone on the Ngimbal language, developing a writing system, producing a dozen booklets in the language and beginning to translate the New Testament into Ngimbal. After working 12 years on the language, my wife and I were called to other tasks within our mission organization. You can imagine our joy now, more than two decades later, to see the Ingemon New Testament finished and polished by others in print. It was a tremendous gift to us to be able to be present on this day of celebration. We send you this copy of the Ingemon New Testament as a thank you gift for your diligence in supporting us with your prayers and gifts these last 36 years. May his name be further magnified as Ngimbal people taste and savor his word. Steve Anderson, let's pray. Father, what, what a thrill. 36 years of mercy toward this church to pay our bills and keep Steve and Julie doing what they're doing. What a thrill that in a partnership, the Holy Word of God, the New Testament, is written in a language that never existed before Steve Anderson created it in writing in the history of the world. That is amazing. And I praise you for every Bible translator on the planet. May some in this room join their ranks, O God, And may the remaining languages in the next 20 years or less have a translating team there fully engaged in turning unwritten languages into writing and writing into Scripture. Now here we are with our untold numbers of translations and our endless copies of the Bible. And I'm going to try to preach a message that would encourage us to read it. Help me, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. As usual, prayer week is bookended by a message on prayer and a message on the Word of God. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that praying to God and hearing from God in His Word is the heartbeat of the Christian life. It's the lub-dub of coronary Christian existence. You can't separate the two. Without the Word of God, our prayers dwindle away into banalities and self-oriented nothings. Without prayer, our Bible reading becomes pedantic and intellectualistic and barren and fruitless. We must hold the two together so we bookend prayer week with a message, pray, and a message, read, meditate, memorize, live in, savor. That's what we're doing now at the end of prayer week. This message, however, is slightly out of place 
in relation to next week's message. Next week, we have a week in which I can return to the New Birth series before we focus on ethnic and racial issues on Martin Luther King weekend, and then pro-life issues on Sanctity of Life weekend, and then return again to New Birth series. But I've got one week in there, and in that week, I'm going to take up our third question. Question number one was, what is it? this thing called the new birth. Question number two was, why do we need it? And question number three will be, how does it come to pass? What are the ways that God uses to make it happen? And what are the involvements we have in experiencing its coming to pass? So, we're going to go to 1 Peter, but here's the catch with today's message. Verse 18 in James 1 is next week's message. And in a sense, since I'm going to preach today on verse 25, no, 21, I should preach on 18 first. But I'm not. I'm going to preach on 18 next week, and I just want you to know that. And I want you to more than know it. I want you to see verse 18 and see the connection and how it all flows. So let's go there. James 1, 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now that phrase, brought us forth, means created us or caused us to be born or produced us. Kind of a broad meaning. Of his own will, he brought us forth. Now that reference is not to our creation. That is our becoming human. It's a reference to our new creation. Our second birth, not our first birth. And I think the reason you can see it, is the way it happens in the verse. Look at it. He brought us forth, how? By the word of truth, which is clearly, as it's used in the New Testament, a reference to the gospel. He brought you forth. He caused you to be born again. He made you a new creature through the gospel, through the word of truth. So this is the new birth here in verse 18, and I should be in the series. I sort of am in the series, but that's next week's message. The text we'll use next week is 1 Peter 1.23. It goes like this. You were born again through the living and abiding word of God. That's almost identical with James 1.18. But there's some things in the context of 1 Peter 1 that I want to draw on. So I'm going to use 1 Peter next time rather than James 1, 18. Now, the reason this message, this text, is so precious for this, this point in prayer week is because of where this leads. Leads to a little talk about anger. If I was talking about anger, I'd linger there and show how the Word of God on the one end of new birth and on the other end of sustaining works on our anger, but I'm not talking about anger at all tonight, except right there. He goes to verse 21, and that's where we're, we're going to focus. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, I want us to take very seriously that command tonight. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. That's all I'm going to talk about. 
I want to understand that. I want to know what that means and why he says it the way he says it and how it will change your 2008. What's remarkable about it to me, in fact, troubling, is the word implanted. He's assuming that the word we are receiving is already implanted. That's strange. Receive with meekness the implanted word. Now, my explanation, for starters, is that that implanting happened in verse 18. He brought us forth by the word of truth. That is, we, we were non-existent in one sense, or we were dead spiritually. We had no place for the word of God in our hearts. We were not born again. We were not new creatures. That's why we needed verse 18 to happen to us. We didn't desire the Word of God. We didn't love the Word of God. Jesus spoke to some leaders, and this is really troubling because these leaders were Bible people. You know that. Pharisees, scribes, chief priests. And he said this, you seek to kill me because my Word finds no place in you. It's not planted there. Now, these, these folks read their Bible every day. And it finds no place. It's not planted. It's not rooted. It hasn't gone down. It hasn't sunk. It hasn't gripped. It's just just being read, memorized even. They could quote long parts of the Torah, and it wasn't in them. Before we are born again, our hearts are full of other things. What's the best way not to be hungry for Thanksgiving dinner? Eat a loaf of white bread for breakfast. Munch on candy all morning. Drink eggnog till it's coming out of your ears. And then sit down for the feast. And it will make you want to throw up. And that's the way people are when they come to the feast of the Word. They're stuffed with other things. There's no place. Jesus said there's no place. It's, your heart is packed with television. It's packed with internet. It's packed with money. It's packed with stock market stuff. It's packed with job. It's packed with family anxieties. It's packed with the riches of this world. It's packed with longings for anything but God. We're not empty people in one sense. There's just no place. For the Word of God. It's not planted there. So when the feast is set before you, there's no hunger, and unregenerate people feel that way about the true meaning of the Bible. Even Pharisees had no place for God's Word in their heart. So verse 18 tells us and we'll unpack this next week in some detail, how that gets remedied. What, what happens if that's the way we are, if we're just so packed with stuff that there's no place for the Word of God and no hunger for the Word of God because I ate my loaf of white bread this morning on the Internet. What happens is that God Almighty causes us to be born again. He brings us forth by the word of 
truth. The Holy Spirit moves through the Word, just riding along with the Word, in the Word, and it's going down through your ear and then down, and He goes down and He penetrates our hearts. Sometimes this is incredibly painful. He's got to go, get the junk out of there, make a place. Give life, attach us to Jesus. The word of God is seen, eyes are open, ears hear, and it's glorious for the first time in our lives. Longing happens for spiritual things. That's the new birth. If you have zero longings for spiritual reality, you're probably not born again. Or you may be in a brief season of struggle. I don't want to paint the condition with too broad a brush. But zero longings for spiritual reality over time is a sign of not being born of God. This has not happened. Verse 18 hasn't happened. So what happens in verse 18 is that the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, moves into our lives on the Word of God and He causes us to be living to the Word of God so that we see it for what it is, we love it for what it is, we desire it for what it is, and it's planted. It's planted. It's gone down deep like a root into our lives. It took root. It's part of us. Now, this is amazing. The Lord causes this new birth to happen by the word of truth. You thought you'd been hearing the word of truth all your life, and it was of very little significance and very little pleasure, very little delight, very little transforming power, and now things are changing because it has been implanted. This word stays. And then here's the amazing consequence It says at the end of verse 21, this word is able to save your souls. Sermons about the word of God are really important if your soul is important. Hell and heaven. Saving a soul means rescuing it from hell and bringing it to God for enjoying him forever. That's what saving a soul means. And you have one and it's hell bound or God bound. And this text says the implanted word received is able to save your soul. That should really cause you to want to listen. Causes me to take seriously my responsibility. Here, your soul is hanging in the balance. We're born again by the Spirit, and we're born again through the Word. One way to catch the seriousness of the Word of God is to see how similar it is to the Spirit of God. I mean, how are you born again? One answer, it is the Spirit that gives life. John 6, 63. How are you born again? Through the living and abiding Word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23. Through the Word of truth. James 1, 18. Word and Spirit never separated in the Christian life. You try to be a Word person without the Spirit? Pedantic, intellectualistic, barren. Try to be a spirit person without the word chaos, charismania. And I love the best of charismatic life. But when spirit without word takes over, emotionalism, not emotion, reigns. Word and spirit do their work together in our lives, in the new birth, and in all other aspects of our lives, which means if you value the Spirit of God as God Himself, you should value the Word of God because they work in tandem and neither works without the other. Here's the way Paul put what's happening in the implanting of the Word. This is 1 Thessalonians 2.13. When you receive the Word, now see if this is true of you. He's talking to the Thessalonian Christians. 
When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Is that true? Is it implanted? Is it rooted? Is it working? Living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, Hebrews says. Here's the way John put it in his first letter. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Spiritual power comes with the abiding of the Word of God in our lives. So now we've got implanted Word, Word at work, Word abiding, Word saving. You can't overstate the importance of the Word of God. I want to ask you, in your ranking of values, where does the Word of God fall in your life as you as you ponder now I've got a year in front of me and I've got things I love things I want to do I want to accomplish I want to be in that list where does the word of God come you need to ask that I'll tell you where it should come a millimeter under God with nothing above it but Him. That's where it should come. Why is this so relevant for for now, for this message? And it's because of that simple phrase, receive with meekness the implanted word. In other words, you were born again by the Word of God on the wings of the Spirit rooting itself in your life, the gospel. It took root and it's there. It'll never be removed. That's what it means to be born again. Now you're told, receive it. Very strange. Receive the implanted Word. Receive with meekness the implanted Word. What in the world? How do you receive it if it's already in you? Well, it's not like kidneys. It's not in you like kidneys. You can't receive your kidneys. They're there, they're doing their work, and they're just there. And you can't receive your kidneys. Be no point in me having preaching a sermon on receive your kidneys. It's just they're just there. This, this, and, and evidently it's not like that because he's saying receive the implanted word. So it's not like kidneys. So what's it like? This is really strange. So what's it like? So I'm, I'm a preacher and I'm sitting at my desk thinking, God, what's it like? How can I help? How can I understand first and then make this plain? Here's my best shot. It's like oxygen. Oxygen gives you life. And the sign of the life is you breathe. And when you breathe, you get more oxygen. It's in you. If it weren't in you, you'd be dead. That it's in you is giving you life. And what this life is shown by is... (sighs) Which means receive, receive, receive more oxygen. That's the best analogy I could come up with to how something can be in you, planted in you, and yet you receive it. And the receiving of it is governed by its being in you. We breathe it in. That's what we ought to do with the Word of God. So, nobody says, I have oxygen. Look how well it's working for me. Makes me alive. I don't need to breathe. 
Nobody talks like that. I got oxygen. Look, I got oxygen. I got it. It's implanted it's right there in my lungs, all through my body. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I've got it. And I don't need to breathe. Nobody says that. The implanted Word of God and the external Word of God are so united that we live by having it already implanted and we live by receiving it. And they're inseparable. This is really serious. Please listen. It is at work in us, Paul says, And the work it does is to make us want to receive it. That's the work it does. The implanted word longs for the word to be received. Just like oxygen makes you alive and life breathes. And breathing receives more oxygen. This is really serious because it says... This implanted word received is able to save your souls. What saves our souls? The implanted word which we receive. Our souls depend on the implanted word. And our souls depend on receiving the word. If you decide that you don't want to receive the external word. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to read. I got the word. I, I was saved. I was born again. I heard the gospel. It came in. It's planted. I don't want to receive the external word. I've got the word. If, if you say that, then you are like a person who says, I don't need to breathe. Now, if you're spiritually dead, you can do that. You can succeed in holding your breath forever if you're spiritually dead. You don't need the external word. You're just getting along just fine without it. And breathing in the word, not a problem. Hold your breath forever. You can do it. But if you're alive, you can't. Oxygen takes over the diaphragm. It will breathe. And you will read. You will. You cannot, with the implanted word, go on and on and on without receiving the implanted word. It's the nature of the word. It lives. It lives. It gives life to the diaphragm, and that muscle will receive. So may you not be found saying, I don't need to breathe. I've got the word. You might be dead. You might be dead. Time will tell. Receive the implanted word, it says, with meekness. What does that mean? James 1.21, receive with meekness the implanted word. Let's just talk about meekness for a moment. I think in this context, when you receive the word with meekness, it means teachability and submissiveness. Readiness to submit. You open your Bible and your heart is, teach me, shape me, change me, do anything to me to make me like Jesus. A meek spirit. The opposite would be to open your Bible and feel suspicious. If you doubt that it's all good or all true or all helpful. Another opposite would be 
come to it receiving it partially. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preserve the right to decide what, what parts of this book I'm going to embrace as God's Word and which parts I'm going to cut out with my penknife. Another opposite of meekness would be a cocky self-assurance that I can understand it and apply it without God's help. You can't. So let's not do the opposite. Let's do meekness. So what would that look like? Let me suggest this. You, you try this and see if this just awakens in your heart. See if you resonate with this spirit. That would be a good sign that you're alive. You come to the Bible and you say to God, I trust you. I submit to you. I need you to help me both be inclined to read it and to understand it and apply it and love it. I need you. Incline my heart to love your word. Open my eyes to see the greatness that is really here and that I'm prone to be blind to. Satisfy my soul with the glory that the Bible says shines off of its page. Satisfy me. Give me the kind of heart that's satisfied with what's here in the Word. I bow. Father, I bow before Your Word. I reverence Your Word. I yield to its supreme truth and value in my life. In all meekness and lowliness, I look to You. I wait for You. Come to me through this word. You are my Savior, my Lord, my God, my friend, my highest treasure. I think that would be a meek way of coming to the Bible. You're after God. You're after Christ. You're, you're, not, you're not a bibliolater. That's a bogus criticism us, for us Bible lovers. We're coming to this book because here's the one place we can with some authority know we're meeting Jesus. And we are Jesus allators for sure. What's the word receive imply? Enough on meekness. What about receive? Receive the implanted word. My goal here is to inspire you to do this, you know. This is a, my target here is several thousand folks entering 2008 awakened in your heart in a new way to want to do this. Receive the implanted word. So I'm just trying to say what it is in a way that it would be compelling. I think uh, receiving means uh, going to it every day. And if you miss a day, feeling the way you do when you try to hold your breath for 30 or 40 seconds or a minute if you're really in shape. You can go without the Bible for a day. And I'm just pleading with you not to try to prove your heroic spirituality by not breathing from Monday to Thursday. Some of you do that, you know. You dip in on Monday morning or Sunday afternoon and, and then you take another breath on Thursday. Find a little time, fit him in with your values. Don't do that. I'm pleading with you as a pastor to my flock. Don't treat the Bible that way. Don't treat your soul that way. Receive it. I think the fact that the very word that we're told to receive is the word that's implanted probably means this. It was the gospel at the center of the Bible that was implanted by the Spirit when we were born again. That's how we got saved. That's how we got born again. We heard the gospel. By gospel, I mean Christ died for our sins. Christ supplied our righteousness. Christ rose from the dead. Christ offers us forgiveness and justification by faith alone. And we have eternal life in Him alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. That's the, that's the center. So if you, if you think of the Word of God, this whole book, is the Word of God, as a fabric. At the center of the fabric is a, oh, I don't know, I don't know anything about knitting or macrame or stitching, but at the center, there's this magnificent, 
portrait of the gospel, this big cloth on your dining room table or flying like a big flag. It's just right at the center is the gospel. But if you try to pull any thread out of this, out of this flag, the whole thing starts to unravel. This is one fabric. And therefore, I want to stress that when it says receive the implanted word, I think there really is an implication you never outgrow your need for the gospel. You never graduate to a course in TBI where the gospel should not be the center of the curriculum. There's no, there's no post-gospel graduate school in the Christian life. The center of every ongoing growth in knowledge has Christ crucified, risen, received by faith alone like a little child at the center of the curriculum. So I think that's what's implanted, rooted there, saving us, and we're to receive that every day. You get up in the morning, you preach the gospel to yourself. My sins are forgiven today. They're forgiven not because I'm somebody, but because Jesus was somebody. He died for me. He rose again. He reigns for me. He's interceding for me. He pleads his blood for me. He's sovereign over me. He sent the Spirit to me by faith alone. You preach the gospel to yourself every morning. You receive it. Over and over again. However, Paul says pretty plainly that this book is inspired and profitable. All Scripture is inspired. God breathed and is profitable, equipping the man of God for teaching and correction and reproof and training in righteousness that we might be fully equipped for every good work. That's the whole Bible with the gospel at the center. So when it says, receive the implanted word, I think it means read your Bible with the gospel at the center every day. I think receiving uh, includes reading, meditating, Memorizing. So I hope you'll come back on Wednesday for being stirred up for memorizing. Here's what uh, Psalm 1 says about the way we receive. His delight is in the law of the Lord. This is the righteous man. His delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he, say the word, meditates, how often? Day and night. He's like a, a what? A tree planted by streams of water. So tree, streams of water, roots obviously. So when the wind blows and it's dry and all the other trees are drying up and complaining, belly aching, saying, where's God? His roots are down in the stream, which is the word which runs through every desert of your life. If you're willing to open it. Its leaf does not wither. And in everything he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. So receiving the word would be going to it, slowly reading it with prayerful, meek, attentive receptivity, and meditating on it mulling over it, asking questions humbly that the Lord would illumine you to answer. And then, so that you can take it with you and feed your soul, memorizing a portion of it. Let me close with a couple of stories. This one came in the email this week to show you the power of the word today. And then I'll read you an old one and we'll be done. I'll try to so adjust just so that it's not discernible to anybody but the one who wrote it. He will recognize it, but nobody else will feel betrayed. My friend made a profession of faith. He and I got together several weeks ago. This is before the profession. I told him that he needs to be reading the Bible and seeking God. I invited him to join us. He couldn't come. But a couple of weeks later, he called me and asked if, if we would be meeting that night. 
we weren't, unfortunately. But then he said, I believe that Jesus is God. I know it, a hundred percent. I asked him more about this, and he told me that since I last saw him, he had been reading his Bible every day. I was with him yesterday and was able to encourage him to continue to read his Bible. Is there a theme in that email? Somebody this week or a couple of weeks ago moved from hell to heaven, from death to life. And the instrument was this. That is, not to overstate it, infinitely important. Last quote. 1495, Thomas Bilney, probably never heard of him, some of you have, little Bilney he was called, an English evangelical reformer about the time of Luther, but in Britain. What was the source of this little man's power? There's a lot of little men, by the way, in Christian church. I mean short. A lot of short powerhouses. John Wesley was 5'2 and could be heard by 10,000 without a microphone and rode 200,000 miles on his horse. Don't judge a book by looking at the cover. (laughs) So here's what little Billy said. I chanced upon this sentence of St. Paul, oh, most sweet and comfortable sentence to my soul. In 1 Timothy 1, it is a true saying and worthy of all men to be embraced that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief and principal. This one sentence, through God's instruction and inward working, which I did not then perceive, did so exhilarate my heart, being before wounded with guilt of my sins and being almost in despair, that immediately I felt a marvelous comfort and quietness in so much that my bruised bones leaped for joy. After this, the scriptures began to be more pleasant to me than the honey or the honeycomb. So, that's my prayer for us, that in 2008, the Word of God, with the gospel of Christ crucified and risen at its center, the Word of God would be sweeter to you than honey, more valuable to you than gold. And I know that gold is valuable today and the dollar is not more valuable than gold, the highest worldly standard of value, higher. That's my prayer. And that the effect of it would be that we go to it and receive it. It's there. It's in us. It's doing its saving work. But if it's there, it's alive. And it has control of our diaphragms. And it will make us breathe. So I'm inviting you to breathe every day. Don't hold your breath from Sunday to Sunday. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I love your Bible because I love you. The Bible is not you. You're more important than the Bible. But after you, I love your word. Couldn't live without your word. My family couldn't live without your word. This church couldn't live without your word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. With it, we live. With it, we hope. With it, we defeat the devil. Make us a people of the word in 2008. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.